My name is Travis Dahl, and I would like to address our society's need for a drastic social change. Being a very complex topic, I'm only going to focus on our culture that's currently based on competition and do a comparison showing the necessity for a culture that's based on cooperation. I'm going to attempt to show how some of our cultural norms that we see every day and have grown to accept and possibly unknowingly support are damaging our entire social, economic, and environmental structure. I'll do a point-by-point -point comparison showing how these issues could be remedied in a cooperative culture, and this presentation will take about 15 minutes. To open this, I want you to think about the last time you heard of, heard of somebody with a child putting them into a sport such as hockey, football, or soccer in order to teach them the importance of competition. Now think about the last time you were at the grocery store to find a child screaming, running around, throwing items off the shelves, and you thought, why don't those people get, get control of their kid and teach them some respect or self-control? What do you think about when you see young children with a religious group knocking at your front door? I mention these issues to bring to your attention that right from birth, we all know, whether we are aware or not, that ch the children in our society are surrounded with and learn from the information and the culture that we present them with. We have a tendency to try and maintain the system we have grown with, not necessarily because it's correct, but, it's, but because it's the only one that we know. We consciously do this to prepare our kids for the world that we feel they will have to live in. We unconsciously do this because the same was done to us and we're merely imitating the environment that we are used to. What this shows, despite our culture's belief of genetic disposition and fate, is that generally the reason that we believe the things we do, from religion to politics to your favorite color, are because of previous experiences in our lives and, and the things that were taught to us as children. Here I'd like to cover a few examples of competition versus cooperation. First, one of the convictions we have supporting competition is in the business sector, and that it protects against monopoly in the market economy. This keeps companies in line with each other so that they will not be charging their consumers astronomical amounts for their products, and this is known as the invisible hand. But in reality what this has done is force companies to create a gradual push to reach the lowest possible price, resulting in a mass market of poorly built and designed products, mass environmental destruction, and slave labor. Perhaps many people feel it's the government's responsibility to ensure there's sufficient legislation in place to control competition and ensure that it remains fair and protects the public and the employees of these companies, so therefore the government will do so. Unfortunately, the competitive structure of the market economy has found it necessary to engage in politics to try and gain an edge against their competition in an attempt to gain market share and increase profit. This puts a damper on the system that's supposed to be in place to keep a leash on the cutting of employees, externalizing costs, for example, dumping toxic waste to avoid disposal costs, tax breaks for the wealthy, the smothering of small companies that don't have the buying power of, the lar of their larger competitors, and the outsourcing of labor to cheaper countries. These are actually all requirements and built-in flaws of the, of the system. This is not evil, and this is not the result of human nature. What if competition were built, in, or sorry, what if uh, rather than competition, cooperation were built into the system? If we were to look at several technologies such as smartphones, cars, and computers, we will see a mass multitude of the same products being wastefully redesigned to be as functionally similar as possible to compete in the market that desires that particular product. As well as being very similar, they also need to be need to incorporate the lowest possible price, which in turn forces lower product qualities since they will be using less qualified labor, lower quality materials, and cheaper machinery to assemble them. An ideal example of cooperation succeeding in the competitive world is Apple computers versus PC products. While Apple has been criticized for being close to outside technologies and having a stringent application approval process, the majority of their software and their hardware is designed in-house. The result of this is on one hand, Apple, Apple users don't have the flexibility of, of a large product base as do PC users, but on the other hand, since there was more internal cooperation put into the design, you end up with a product that is much more stable with significantly less crashing and program conflict. Imagine for a moment that all the automotive manufacturers banded together in an open source-like system to create less multiple designs for the same application 
a higher quality and better functioning product using the, using the most advanced technologies available. There could be less waste, more ideas, more possibilities of uses, and more efficiency of these products. The way things are operated now, most of these companies develop their products behind closed doors, and the design is not known until the first unit is sold. Toyota is one company that's become the leading auto manufacturer by incorporating cooperation into the production and design plan. So not only are we wasting material and energy design and, and energy designing and manufacturing these multiple products, we're wasting even more by having to fix finished work and replace broken or worn out products that were not designed sufficiently in the first place. Do you remember do you remember when your cell phone started acting up two weeks after the warranty expired? If these companies work together to build a product that was that was singular in nature, used higher quality materials, and was superior in design, since more minds are better than less and it's shown that cooperation inspires creativity, we could have significantly less waste in our lives. Think about the multitude of different types of machines that are needed just, just to manufacture those multitude of products. I'm going to purposely leave out the need for these companies to have you replace those products continually just so they can maintain a steady income since the topic of cyclical consumption is a topic that I feel deserves a, a, a separate report on its own. My second example is with our children. We employ competition practices with them as well. Kids sit separately from each other in school. They're encouraged to do the best they can on their own to achieve a higher grade than any of the others. They're often pushed in competitive sports to, to be the best rather than to have fun. I'm sure their parents do this to try and push their children to achieve excellence, high levels of self-esteem, and to enjoy themselves. But is this really what's enforced by this type of environment? Alfie Kahn describes competition as being able to succeed only if others fail. This is believed to enforce confidence in children since they were the best at the task in, at hand, and therefore the more people that you have beaten, the better person that you are. This might seem contradic contradictory, as being a good person is often associated with compassion and sharing, which doesn't really fit into the definition of competition. Also, the child ends up in a situation where he or she has to beat others in order to feel good about him or herself. So how does this child feel when they feel about themselves when they become the inevitable loser? This forces a natural distrust between friends who could be, or are, competitors as it is irrational to trust somebody who gains from your failure in a competitive system. What if we turned our competitive structures in childhood into cooperative ones? Terry Orlick writes a book full of cooperative games. Take the game of musical chairs for instance. Instead of one by one, each child progressively becoming losers and having to sit aside while watching the others play, Orlick suggests having the kids try to pile onto less and less chairs. Naturally, by the end of the game, you'll have seven or eight laughing kids working together to try and keep each other on the chair. As for the benefits to, com to competitive sports that are regularly expressed as necessary, these are easily reproduced in cooperative games. Exercise, teamwork, improving physical and mental skills, creating challenges and achieving goals are all experiences that can be had without having a person or a team to triumph over. My third example is in industry. Slowly at first, but increasingly accelerating over the last century, there's been the replacement of workers by automation. This phenomenon was originally promised to shorten the work week for workers while keeping wages the same as production became more and more efficient. But, naturally, what this has done instead has, has been a steady cutting back of the human labor force to replace it with more consistent, tireless, vacationless machinery. This has been largely due to a company's necessity in the marketplace to compete with other companies to get an edge on them or to catch up with the others who've already taken that step. In turn, this has pushed much of the population that once worked in, in the manufacturing sector into the service industry. But now technologies continue to be, become more varied and more sophisticated, and we have it beginning to replace workers in the service industry as well. A common free market argument is that each person that is replaced in the market by a machine Another job is created to manufacture and maintain that machine. But let's think about that for a second. Hypothetically, we have one person who works in an automated factory that produces, let's say, 50 automated checkouts per month. 
This factory has a staff of 150 and they produce everything in-house. At the end of the year, their job is finished relating to the task. This person, this, this person's share of the work for the year has replaced four tellers. Their wages have been paid and they rely on needing to build more machines that replace more people to continue being paid. The same applies for everyone who built the machinery to build the auto checkouts as well as the designers. In the store, the standard I have seen is one person managing four checkouts instead of, instead of, uh, instead of one per checkout. That's an automatic 75% decrease in employment right there. Now for the job that was created to maintain these machines, this particular worker can service many machines in a month. Not the commonly stated one job for one machine simply because we are automating more and more tasks in our economy and the machines simply do a better job and more, and more efficiently than, than the people do. This is one of the many reasons why our economy is failing right now. Jobs are being replaced by machines which is resulting in people's inability to find new work in that field as well as losing their wages from that job. They then have to accept handouts from governments or charitable organizations to either upgrade their skills, if they're lucky, or just to feed themselves. But what happens when these organizations are also suffering from the mass lack of wages and sales due to the population being replaced by machines and unable to afford, the, afford their products? In short, people are unable to compete with the machines. So what do we do? Do we stop the technology? I think that would be very difficult. How do you how do you convince everybody in the world to go back to manually working as a farmer just to make sure that everybody has a job to do? Naturally, the reason these technologies were produced in the first place was to make everybody's lives easier and solve and solve some some of our technical problems. As our production becomes more and more efficient, all that should mean is that people should be freer to pursue their interests rather than working the majority of their lives on repetitive and seemingly meaningless labor that can be done by a machine. But this would require the cooperation en masse amongst the population to achieve this goal rather than competing to have access to this technology. So I want to conclude by saying that I feel that there is a need for our society to start to change toward a more cooperative one. From the standpoint that industry could work together to develop better, less wasteful products, children could be learning in a more integrated and stimulating environment, and that the general population could be pulled out of monotonous, repetitive jobs that they hate. I hope that I've provided some information that if it doesn't convince you or reinforce previ previously held belief, will at least spark some thought about the negative effects on co competition on a, of a comp oh geez, of a competition-based society. Not just for children, companies, or within countries, but as an entire world culture and society. We can see the effects of, lack of, of the lack of cooperation nearly everywhere we look, if we look, and have only provided a couple of examples. There's also much more information providing examples of how a cooperative society could be accomplished at the zeitgeistmovement.com. To close, I would like to ask a question. If we are inherently selfish creatures who need reward, monitoring, and punishment to accomplish anything, then why, in a society that's built around that concept, do we still find acts of generosity, kindness, and compassion trying to balance out the problems caused by this system? Maybe we really do have the capacity and the desire to operate successfully in a cooperative environment. Maybe we only need to be trained to do so.